Hello friends, welcome to another video of Hybrid Academy and to the next session of Learn Adobe Photoshop for Beginners. In today's session, we will learn about the basic Photoshop skills. So let's review the course agenda for today's session. To begin with, we will start with the learning of history palette and then we will move on to basic Photoshop skills where we will see how to place a graphic document in Photoshop resizing image or document, resize or rotate a selection, lines with drawing tools, creating curved designs, layer transparency and adjustment, fading an image, blending two images and drop shadow of an image. Let's move on to the first section of our session. History palette. The history palette is a log of all the actions we perform in Photoshop. By default, the history palette contains the last 20 changes done to the image. Each time we change the image, a new state is added to the history palette. So here is another hidden gem in Photoshop. This simple tool can make your life so easy. The history palette lists your most recent steps that you have made on your image. And the cool thing here is that it allows you to undo any unwanted actions you have made back to the previous state. To jump to a particular state, we click on that state name in the history palette and all the other actions after that state will become greyed out and italicized. The other cool thing within the history palette is that it allows you to set your own limit of step backwards in its memory. To do this, you need to go to the edit menu of Photoshop Select Preferences and Performance in case of Windows and select Performance from the Preference menu in case of Mac. There are shortcuts which can use with the History Palette for quick access. So in the example below, you can see that we can set the History States. The default limit is 20 and you can see we have changed this to 100 in this. So we can go back 100 steps, whatever we have performed in our image. Let's see how we can do this. Let's perform some actions in Photoshop. So the first action I'm going to perform is to create a rectangular mark you. I'll create a new layer. And let me fill some color in this. Second step I'll do is create an elliptical mark you. And let me just try to fill some color in this also. Third step I'll create another rectangular mark you and we'll fill some color in this also. Now if we go to the history palette on the right hand side, this history palette is visible by default and in case if it is not visible, you can go to the window menu on the top and you can select history from the list. So once you select this, you can see that the history palette appears. And over here you can see all the steps which I have performed. So the first step was I created a new document, I created a rectangular mark you. I created a new layer, I filled the color in this, so whatever steps I keep on selecting, all those steps keep on getting performed and I can go to as many steps back and as many steps forward. So this is the history palette in Adobe Photoshop. Moving further to the next section, let's see how we can place a graphic document in Photoshop. Instead of opening an image in a brand new Photoshop document, we can also place an image in an existing document as a smart object. In Photoshop Creative Cloud, go up to the file menu and choose Place Embedded. In Photoshop CS6, go to the file menu and choose Place. 
Smart objects are layers that contain image data from raster or vector images such as Photoshop or Illustrator files. Smart objects preserve an image's source content with all its original characteristics, enabling you to perform non-destructive editing to the layer. With smart objects, we can perform non-destructive transformations. We can scale, rotate, skew, distort, perform transform or warp a layer without losing original image data or quality because the transforms don't affect the original data. With smart objects, we work with vector data such as vector artwork from Illustrator or otherwise would be rasterized in Photoshop. We can perform non-destructive filtering. We can edit filters applied to the smart objects at any time. Edit one smart object and automatically update all its linked instances. With smart objects, we can apply a layer mask that's either linked or unlinked to a smart object layer. And we can try various designs with low resolution placeholder images that you can later replace with the final versions. On the other hand, with the smart objects, we cannot perform the alter pixel data such as painting, dodging, burning or cloning. To do this, we need to convert the smart object to a rasterized object or convert to raster image. Let's see how we can do this in Photoshop. In Photoshop, we will go to the file menu we will select the option of place embedded. Once we click on this, it will ask us to select the image we wish to place. So let me just select this image. This is a small image which I have created using the shapes in Photoshop. And I've placed this as an embedded smart object in Photoshop. Now I'm trying to transpose this to a smaller scale and I have pressed enter. And now if I again try to expand this and press enter, you see this will not be deterred or the quality of this particular image will not be disturbed. Whereas if I try to use the same object as a rasterized object, doing this won't be possible. Let's see how we can do that. I am creating a copy of this on a different layer. You can see that this is on a different layer and I am Converting the second layer to a rasterized object. So I will right click on this and I will select rasterize layer. So right now these both the uh, objects are of same size, same quality. Now let me just try to transpose the second object to a smaller section. Once this is done, I will try to again expand this to a larger one as we did with the previous object. And let's see. You can see that the edges are not sharp like before and it's getting a bit blurred. Let's perform this once again. I'll again reduce this in size and press enter. And I'll again increase this in size and press enter. You can see every time I'm reducing the size and expanding the size, it is losing the quality. Whereas if I try to do the same with the first one, which is a smart object, It won't lose the quality of the image. The edges are still sharp, still crisp, whereas this is not happening with the second one, which is a rasterized layer. So this rasterized layer is losing the quality every time we are expanding it from a smaller version. Similarly, if we try to use tools like burn tool or dodge tool on each of these, so these tools are easily applicable on the rasterized layer. You can see that the burn tool, you can see the uh, darkness as I'm using the burn tool on this. Whereas if I try to use the burn tool on the smart object, it won't allow me. It's not allowing me to do this. So 
So this is actually not possible with the smart object. And to perform this, I will have to convert this smart object to a rasterized object. Moving further to the next section, let's see the resizing of image or document in Photoshop. Image resizing is one of the most common image manipulation workflows that allows you to customize the size of your image based on the needs without losing its crispness. To do this, we need to go to the image menu in Photoshop and we get an option of image size. Once we click on image size, we get a dialog box for image resizing and let's see the options which are available in the image resizing dialog box. So the first option is dimensions. This is used to change the unit of measurement for the image. And using this, we can change the image unit from pixels to maybe percentage, inches, centimeters, millimeters, or whatever you want. Now the next option is fit to. Using this option, we can either choose a preset to resize the image or choose auto resolution to resize the image to a specific printing output. So at times we have some limitations for printing where the paper size can be a limitation where the printer can be a limitation so in such cases we can select the predefined sizes from this drop down of fit to where it automatically provides you the paper sizes like a4 a5 a6 or legal letter etc or you can also select auto resolution where it will based on the pixels based on the megapixels of the image it will select the resolution of the picture automatically below that is the constraints this is to maintain the width and height measurement ratio the constraint proportion option should be enabled otherwise this will distort the image or this will dither the image this is actually a link between the width and the height and which ensures that the width automatically changes or the height automatically changes as you change the other parameter. So if you increase the height in the same ratio it will increase the width and if it decrease the height in the same ratio it will decrease the width. Next option is the resolution. This is to change or alter the resolution of an image. So resolution is basically the pixels per inch or dots per inch and using this we can actually change the resolution of the picture. To whichever resolution you want you can change the resolution so in that case the picture quality will be reduced last is to resample and this is to change this image size or resolution and allow the number of pixels to adjust proportionately let's see how we can do this in photoshop in adobe photoshop we have this option available under the image menu as image size and the shortcut for this is alt control plus i in case of windows and options command plus i in case of mac so once we click on this you can see it gives this dialog box in which on the left hand side we have the preview which we can expand or reduce based on our requirement and on the right hand side, we get all the options which we just discussed. So if you look at this, the current dimensions of this image which is currently open is 3718 pixels, that's the width and 2479 pixels, that's the height. Now if I wish to view this in any other unit of measurement, I can just click on this down arrow and I can select inches, I can select centimeters, I can select millimeters or whatever unit we prefer. So in case of inches, if I see, this image is approximately 52 inches by 34 inches in size. Using this, we can only view the dimensions in different measuring units. The second option is to resize this image as per some standards, for example, A4, A6, legal, letter, 4x6, 5x7, 8x10, 11x14. These are some standard paper sizes for photographic paper. So if you go to a photographer to get your image developed, 
it will give you the options of 4 by 6, 5 by 7. So accordingly, I can resize this image as per the standard paper sizes. I can also load some other paper sizes. I can save my own presets. And I can also select some standard screen resolutions like 960 by 640 or 1024 by 768. So these are some screen resolutions. These are some paper sizes. These are photo paper sizes and many more are available. Now, in case if I wish to resize this image, let's say in inches, I want to, I currently the size of this image is 51.639 inches and I wish to resize this in inches to let's say 20 inches. So you see, as soon as I updated the width, the height automatically got changed. This is because this constraint proportion option is enabled and these both width and height are linked with each other. If I uncheck this option or if I release this option, now these are not linked. So in this, that case, if I increase or decrease the size, let's say if I again make, make it to 40, you see this image will be stretched in one direction. So the width is 40, but the height still remains the same. This actually disturbs the image quality and makes it dithered and stretched. So it is always suggested to select this option so that both the width and height are changed in the same proportion. Next is the resolution of the picture. This is the pixels per inch or pixels per centimeter. So using this you can increase the quality of image, how the image should look like. So the more resolution we have, the better is the quality of the picture. But this also disturbs the size of the picture that it will become more heavier. So a picture with 300 pixels per inch will contain more pixels will be heavier in compared to a picture with 72 pixels per inch. And the last option is to resample. And these are also some standard methods of resampling the picture where the uh, details are preserved and bicubic smoother. These are some standards which are used to resample the image for different resolutions. So right now you can see uh, let me just resize this. I changed this to 20 and the height is 30. The resolution was 72. And now if I click on this, you'll see the image size is reduced to 20 inches by 13 inches, where it was initially 51 inches. Let's move on to the next section of this session that is to resize and rotate a selection. To resize an image within the layer palette, all what is required is to select the correct layer which holds the image and use the transpose tool available in Photoshop. When transforming any layer type, dragging a corner handle now scales the layer proportionally by default indicated by maintain aspect ratio button that is the link icon in the on state in the options bar. To change the default transform behavior to non-proportional scaling, simply turn off the maintain aspect ratio that is the link icon button. The shift key while pressed now acts as a toggle for maintain aspect ratio button. To transform an image, select edit free transform or use the shortcut key Control plus T in case of Windows and Command plus T in case of Mac. The following options are available to perform on an image using the transform option. First option is scale. This enlarges or reduces an item related to its reference point, the fixed point around which the transformations are performed. You can scale horizontally, vertically or both horizontally and vertically. Second option is to rotate. This turns an item around the reference point. By default, this point is at the center of the object. However, we can move it to any other location as per our own preference. Skew. This slants an item vertically or horizontally. Distort. This stretches an image in all directions. Perspective applies one point perspective to an item. Warp 
this manipulates the shape of an item then to rotate 180 degree 90 degree clockwise or 90 degree counter clockwise this rotates an item by specified number of degrees either clockwise or counter clockwise and last is the flip this flips an item vertically or horizontally now let's see how to do this all in photoshop as we discussed in photoshop the shortcut key for transpose is control plus t but we can also do it from the edit menu that is edit and free transform you can see the shortcut key as control t so once we click this you can see that we get the handles on every corner and every edge now using this we can transform this image on the canvas which is white in the background if we look at the center this is the reference point which is in the center by default however if we want we can even change the location of this reference point to wherever we want on the top in the options bar you can see this is the link icon which actually maintains the aspect ratio right now it is clicked and on So if I try to transpose this image since this option of maintain aspect ratio is on now if I try to transform this image or scale this image it will be done proportionally that is the height and the width would be adjusted automatically In this direction also if I try to reduce it you see the height and the width is maintained proportionally whereas if I try to transpose this without this option checked this will actually distort the image and i can drag it or stretch it to any particular direction i want so this is not done proportionally another option available in the options bar is for the reference point if you want to see the reference point this needs to be checked and if i do not want to see the reference point i can uncheck this so now the reference point is gone I personally prefer to keep the reference point visible because in reference to this I can actually transform my image. Now the other options which are available are the first one is the free transform this we have already done second is scale using scale we can actually reduce or enlarge the image proportionally or not in a proportional as per our choice. Now this depends on the selection of this link icon Next option is to rotate. This rotation is done in reference to the reference point. Now, you can see the reference point is in center and if I try to rotate this picture, it will be rotated as per the reference point. Whereas if I move this reference point to any other location and now if I try to rotate this, it will be rotated from that reference point. So this reference point is really very helpful, especially when you try to rotate the picture. So if I let's say keeping the eye of this bird as a reference point if i wish to rotate this and want the bird to be in horizontal position see how easy it is again pressing control plus t to transpose this and the next option is to skew skew is basically used in case if i wish to move the edges of any object in a parallel direction So let's see if I try to move this right edge in a parallel direction it won't go left and right but yes it can go top and bottom so this actually acts as a parallelogram let's try on the left edge and similarly on the top edge and bottom edge now this can also be done on multiple edges See, I've already done it on the bottom edge, and if I try to do it on the left edge also, I can do it. And if I try to do it from the corner, it will always be in a parallelogram format.
coming back to the original image and pressing control T to transpose. The next option is to distort. Now as the word suggests distort, this means that I can move any edge, any corner to whichever direction I want. So you see the rest, all the three corners remain the same but this corner is getting distorted. Similarly, if I try to put it from the edge, rest everything will remain the same but all the corners and edges related to this particular spot or this particular handle will be distorted. So this has actually distorted the image but in case of objects this is very helpful. Again coming back to the original image and pressing Ctrl plus T to transform. The next option is perspective. Perspective is somewhat like skew, however this actually changes the image as per the perspective. This will actually not distort the image but will change the perspective and it works relatively with the other edge also. So if I am just trying to reduce the top right corner, you see the bottom right corner is also coming closer. So this is actually changing the perspective from which perspective we are looking at the image. So this looks like as if I am looking from the top left corner to this image. So this is actually changing the perspective of the image. Coming back to the original image. Now there are few shortcuts to this. I am pressing Ctrl plus T and if I press only the shift button. Now you see the link icon is not clicked but if I press and hold shift while scaling this, this will automatically scale this in a proportionate manner. Whereas if I release the shift button and try to scale this, this will not be in proportionate manner. So shift key actually helps to proportionately scale the object. On the other hand, if I press the alt button and then try to scale this, it will actually move it relatively to other edges also. So if I am reducing the height, it is getting reduced from both the edges from top edge and the bottom edge. And if I am trying to reduce or increase the width, it is getting done from both the edges left and right. Now let's try the combination of both shift and alt. So in that case, this image will proportionately be reduced. Now the next shortcut is the control key. If I press the control key and try to transform this, this is actually working as distort. So now I can actually move any edge, any corner as per my own choice pressing the control key. So this is making this image distort. Now the last option, I am pressing control T for transform and I am holding Ctrl, Shift and Alt, all the three keys together and now if I try to do this, this will be like perspective. This will actually be work as a perspective manner. How I wish to change the perspective of this image. So using the Ctrl, Shift and Alt key, different transformations can be performed. Now the last option of transformation, I am again pressing Ctrl plus T and from the right click menu, I am selecting the last option of warp. Now this warp is actually used to change the shape of the object. Now right now you can see this is a rectangle and if I wish to change the shape, I can use these corners to change the shape. So looking at this, it looks like as if the picture is getting rotated on the right edge. Using these handles, we can actually change the shape of the object. And the plus point is that by clicking over the object, you can also change the overall look of the object or the complete scenario. 
this is somewhat beyond distort this is somewhat beyond skewing this is to the next level and this is known as warp at times we need to fit an object inside another object so at that case this warp is very helpful Now let's see a couple of more options which are also known as automatic transformations because here we do not do it manually but they are done automatically. So I'm pressing control plus T and you can see that the image is ready for transformation. I right click on the image or the object and there are options like rotate 180 degree. So this will actually rotate this image by 180 degree completely. See. And again, if I rotate it 180 degree, it will again be a straight image like before. The other option is to rotate 90 degree clockwise. So the bird will go down. I'm doing undo. And I can also rotate this 90 degree counterclockwise. So the bird will go up. So as per our requirement, we can actually change or we can rotate the image. And if you want to rotate this manually, that is also possible in reference to the reference point. So since the reference point is in center, so this is getting rotated accordingly. Also in case of automatic transformations, if I change the reference point, I move it to some other location. Let's say I move it to this point or maybe this point, or let's move it to the tail of the bird. And now if I try to rotate this, clockwise 90 degree it will be in reference to the reference point only I move this to any point see this happens in reference to the reference point and the image gets rotated and last but not the least we have the flip option which is flipped horizontally so this will actually flip the image horizontally again in reference to the reference point so let's change the reference point to the center and now try to flip it so I right click and select flip horizontal so you see the picture gets flipped horizontally and similarly if I wish to flip it vertically I can do that also and this transformation need not be on an image this can be applied to any object or anything which is there in Photoshop so let's see let's let me try some shape suppose I'm making a rectangle I'm selecting a color I'm filling this color let's move this to a new layer so on a new layer I'm filling a color and now if I press ctrl plus T right now if you see layer 2 is selected which only holds the rectangle and selecting layer 2 if I press ctrl T so only this object will be selected I can either scale this I can skew this I can distort this and I can even rotate this So this transformation can be applied to anything which is there in Photoshop. Moving further, let's see how we can work on lines with drawing tools. Photoshop comes with the ability to draw and edit vector shapes easily. You can also convert your vector shapes to a raster or pixel based shape. From the toolbar, click and hold the shape tool group icon to bring up the various shape tool options like rectangle, ellipse, triangle, polygon, line and custom shape. Select a tool for the shape you want to draw. Shape tools options are mode. Set a mode for your shape tool whether you wish to draw a shape, a path and pixels. Fill is the option to choose a color to fill your shape. Stroke is the option to choose a color, width and the type of shape stroke. So this will actually be the outline of the shape. We will see this in Photoshop. Width and height, 
this is to manually set the width and height of your shape. Path operations. Use path operations to set the way your shape interact with each other. Path alignment is used to align and distribute your shape components. Path arrangement is used for the arrangement to set the stacking order of shapes you create. And additional shape and path options are used by clicking the gear icon to access additional shape and path options to set attributes such as width and color, on-screen display of your path and constraint options while drawing shapes. Let's see these options in Photoshop. So in Photoshop, we have the drawing tool here, which actually looks like a rectangle initially because this is the default tool. And the shortcut for this is letter U as an umbrella. So once you click and hold on this, you will see other drawing tools which are available. The first one is the rectangle tool. Then we have the rounded rectangle tool. Then we have the ellipse tool. We have the polygon tool. We have the line tool. And finally, we have the custom tool. Whichever drawing you wish to draw, you can select the respective tool. To draw a square, we can use the rectangle tool and to draw a circle, we can use the ellipse tool. Once the tool is selected, we can select whether we wish to draw a shape, whether we wish to draw a path or we wish to draw pixels. We will see this in a while. The second option is the fill color of the shape. The shape which we will draw would be of which color. And if you do not find the color in the recently used colors, you can create your own color using the color picker. So using this, you can create any color you want. Next is the stroke. This is the color of the line or the outline of the uh, shape we will draw. Let's say I select the blue color. And after this is the width of the outline. So by default it is zero. You can extend this to whatever level you want. So suppose I want a four pixel boundary. Now it is selected as 4.43. Let me make this exactly four. We'll review the rest of the tools further. Now I've selected the rectangle tool and let me just try to create a rectangle. So you see the fill color is green by default and the stroke is blue. Going further, this is the type of line you want. So it can be a dashed line. It can be a dotted line. You can see the difference if I extend the width of the line. So this is the dotted line. This is the dashed line and this is a straight line. You can further customize this line with the help of more options and there are more options available using this you can customize this. Next is the width of this rectangle and the height of this rectangle. I can customize this. I can mention the width manually and the height manually and this icon ensures that the ratio of width and height remains the same. So if I increase the width, the height would respectively be changed and if I increase the height, the width would respectively be changed. But if I uncheck this option, now we can individually change the height and width manually using these options. The next option available is the path operations. And to use this, I need to have two shapes on the single layer. So let me just draw the first shape. And without removing the selection, I need to create another shape on the same layer. So if you see, these both the shapes are on the same layer. Now I can use this option to either combine these two shapes. So this will be combined into a single shape. I can subtract the front shape from the back one. So you can see this section of the new drawing, which was overlapping the previous drawing, got subtracted or deleted from the previous drawing. Similarly, I can intersect the shapes. So this is the common area which gets highlighted in the rest part got deleted. And we can also exclude the overlapping areas or overlapping shapes. So in this case, this is the inverse of the previous one. So this got 
removed and the remaining area which is not getting overlapped remains. The next option is to bring the shape to front or bring the shape forward, bring shape. So this is basically to align the shapes one over the other. When we selected the option which said subtract front shape. So in this we need to ensure which one is on front this or this. So to send this to back we can use this option send shape backward. So once this goes backward this this path operation got vice versa. So now you can see there is a change in the subtraction part. Now let's try the alignment option. To check the alignment option I again need two different shapes on the same layer. So I will first let me just first draw a rectangle. So I have drawn a rectangle. I will change the color of the shape and I will change the outline also for the shape. Now while this is selected I will draw another shape and this time let me select the polygon. Now when I select the polygon tool I need to first define the number of sides I wish to have for the polygon. Right now it says 6. Let's say I wish to draw a polygon with 8 sides. Now while this is selected I will create this polygon on the same layer and to create it on the same layer I need to press the shift key on the keyboard. So this will ensure that these both the objects or both the drawings are on the same layer. So when I leave it, you can see that both these are on the same layer. Now I can align these two together by pressing the control key and I can click on the shape I wish to move. So you can see I have moved this like below the rectangle. Now to align both these shapes, I need to select both the shapes together. So I will press shift plus control and then I will click on both the layers one by one. So you see. The polygon is also selected and the rectangle is also selected. Now this tool will automatically be highlighted. If I wish to align them towards the left edge, I click on this. So you see both these shapes are aligned to the left edge. If I wish to align them to center, I can click on this. And if I wish to align them to the right side, I will click on this. Similarly, if I wish to align them to top edge, I will click on this. If I wish to align them center, Vertically, I will click on this and if I wish to align them to the bottom edge, I will click on this. So this way, I can actually align them with each other. And post this, we can align the path operation functions, maybe subtraction or maybe intersection, whatever we want. So this actually makes a new shape for us. Moving further in Photoshop, let's see the creating of curved designs. Now this is one of the most important sections of Photoshop because using this we can later create selections and we can do much more in Photoshop. So the pen tool is a simple selection tool with a wide variety of applications for users at every skill level. Photoshop provides multiple pen tools to suit your use cases and creative style. The standard pen tool lets you draw straight segments and curves with great precision. The freeform pen tool lets you draw paths as if you were drawing with pencil on a piece of paper. A curvature pen tool lets you intuitively draw curves and straight segments. A magnetic pen lets you draw a path that snaps to the edges of a defined area in your image. Moving further, we can use the pen tool to draw straight line segments, to draw curves with pen tool, to draw straight lines followed by curves, draw two curved segments connected by a corner, finish the drawing path, freeform pen tool, draw using the magnetic pen option and creating curved designs. So let's see how we can do this in Photoshop. 
So in Photoshop, this is the pen tool which we are going to use. And if I click and hold this, it will show me all the tools which are there under the pen tool. The shortcut for pen tool is letter P as in Papa. However, this only works for the first three tools and the rest three tools do not have a shortcut key. But yes, we can do this using shortcut keys. So let's see how we can do this. So the first tool we have here is the pen tool. Pen tool can be used to draw straight lines or it can also be used to draw different shapes. We can also use the pen tool to draw curves. So to draw curves, instead of clicking on point to point, we can click and drag the point. So let me just try it like this. I have clicked and dragged the point vertically. Now to make this a curve, now this is actually not a curve. To make this a curve, this would be the starting point and the next where I click would be the ending point for the curve. And to shape the curve, I will again drag the second point in the way I want. So you can see that this becomes a curve. Similarly, this would be the next starting point and wherever I click would be the ending point for the next curve. And so on, we can create curves. Now, if, if I put my pointer on the first point of starting, you'll see there's a small circle which shows that this will actually close this curve. Now, once this is closed, we can either convert this to a shape or we can convert this to a selection. And to convert this to a selection, we need to press the control key and the enter key. And you can see that this gets converted into a selection. We can also create selections with straight lines. Once the path is closed, we can always press Ctrl Enter and this will convert this to a selection. Even if the path is not closed and you press Ctrl Enter, it will automatically join the last two points to make it a selection. The next tool we have here is the free form pen tool. Using this, we can draw like we draw with a pencil on a piece of paper. So you can draw any shape you want. And once you take the mouse pointer to the first point of starting, it will again show the same circle. And once you release it, it will close the path. And again, pressing control enter will convert this to a selection. So just like the lasso tool, we use to create selections. You can even use this free form pen tool to create selections of whichever shape you want. And later you can press control plus enter to convert this to a shape. The next we have is the curvature pen tool. Now this tool is used to draw curves. Now for this, I'll click first point and click the second point. Initially, it will create a straight line, but on creating the third point, it will automatically convert this to a curve. And you can see the way I move this third point, the curve changes. So with this, I can even create a circle if I want. Although it doesn't look like a circle, but yes, we can always change these points to make it look like a circle. The next option we have is to add anchor point. Using this, we can add more anchor points to this path. And using the next option, we can delete these anchor points as we want. So once you click on these points using the delete anchor point button, it will delete the anchor buttons. Remember one point. The less the number of anchor points, the better the curve goes. More anchor points create sharp edges, 
which we do not want. We want them to be curved. So for that, we need to use minimum number of anchor points. Now the last tool, which is the most important tool, is the convert point tool. This actually converts the anchor point to a corner and a corner to an anchor point. So right now, if you see, if I click on this, it was a curve and it got converted into a corner. And if I again click on this and drag it, it will convert this into a curve like earlier. If I again click on this, this will be converted into a corner. So this works both the ways. Now, as I told you initially that the first three tools has the shortcut key of letter P as in Papa, the bottom three options do not have a shortcut key, but we can always use these three options using the shortcut key. And to use them, we first need to ensure that the default pen tool is selected and the path we have created is also selected. Once the path is selected, you can always add more anchor points using the Alt key. Press the Alt key and click on the path to add more anchor points. So that's the first option we have is add anchor point. The second option we have is to delete anchor points. So to delete anchor points, we simply need, we don't have to press anything. We simply need to click on any existing anchor point and you will see that the anchor point gets deleted. Now the third option is to convert, that is the convert point tool. So to use this, we simply need to press the alt button on the keyboard and click on any of the points. And once you click on this, you see this got converted into a corner. Similarly, if I wish to convert this, this got converted into a corner. Now again to convert a corner back to a point, we can press the alt key and then click and drag a corner to make it back a point. Similarly, I can also convert this corner to a point by pressing the Alt button on the keyboard or the Options button in case of Mac and click and drag this corner to get this converted to a point. Now this point has two handles, one on the left and one on the right. These individual handles are used to manage the curves on each side of this point. So suppose I use the right handle, this will manage the right side of the curve and if I use the left handle, this will be used to manage the left side of the curve. To use these handles in a symmetrical way when both the handles go in sync with each other and changing the direction of one handle affects the other, we, we need to use the control key on the keyboard or the command key in case of Mac to click on them and to move them. If we wish to move these handles not in sync with each other or want to make it a sharp corner, we need to press the Alt key on the keyboard or the options key in case of Mac to move these handles. Now these are not connected to each other and are and can create sharp point. Anytime when the path is complete, we can always convert this into a selection. So we saw that the last three options which are there in the pen tool do not have a shortcut key but we can always use them with different key combinations. To add the anchor point, we simply need to select the pen tool and click on the path to add the anchor point. To delete the anchor point, we need to To delete the anchor point, we can simply click on any of the anchor points using the pen tool and the point gets deleted. And to use the convert point tool, we press and hold the alt key and the regular pen tool gets converted into a convert point tool. 
Alt key is used here for three different reasons. One is to convert a corner into an anchor point. Second is to convert an anchor point to a corner. And third, to manage the handles of a point individually, independent of each other. Now let's move to the next section that is the layer transparency and adjustment. A layer's transparency and blending mode determines how its pixels blend with underlying pixels in the image. This can create a variety of special effects using blend modes. A layer's overall opacity determines to what degree it obscures or reveals the layer beneath it. A layer with 1% opacity appears nearly transparent whereas one with 100% opacity appears completely opaque. Everyone who uses Photoshop has to fade an image sometime or another. All the images have been faded on the front page of all the magazines. It's a great way of getting your images to blend in with your background. Photoshop gives you many ways of doing this, but we are going to look at the following two, layers and gradient masks. Further, let's see the blending of two images. The blending mode specified in the options bar controls how pixels in the image are affected by a painting or editing tool. Think in terms of the following colors when visualizing a blending mode effect. The base color is the original color in the image. The blend color is the color being applied with the painting or editing tool. The result color is the color resulting from the blend. Now to check the opacity in Photoshop, I am having two different images. This is the background layer or the base layer. Then I have a sunset picture with a sellout of two people and a model picture which has been cropped from the background. Now let's try to set the opacity of these pictures so that they blend into each other. So to do this, first of all, I would like to move this sun a bit towards the center and to do that I will first create a selection of the sun and will bring this out to a new layer. I will create a selection, I will select the base layer and I will press Ctrl plus J to create a copy of this layer from the selection I had made. So this is a separate selection over the base layer. I'll hide the selection or the copied layer and will first try to hide the sun. So one way to do this is to use the patch tool from the toolbar. I can select the area I wish to patch and then I can drag it on the other side from where I wish to pick the color. But you see there is a slight outline visible in this. The other option can be I can make the selection and then I can go to edit. I can select fill and I can select the content aware option and click on OK. So this will automatically fill this area with the content which is surrounding it. So see now the sun is gone. Now I have a copy of the sun which I'll try to adjust a bit towards the center. Like this. But this is also showing sharp edges. So now I will use the eraser tool. I'll make it a bit bigger. And will reduce the hardness to zero. So that it doesn't form the edges. And I'll try to delete the sharp corners of this section. 
So now you can see the sun is moved towards a bit center. Now let's try to adjust the model picture on top of this and try to blend this with the background. So to blend this, we will select the respective layer on which we want to apply the transparency effect. We will go to opacity and we will reduce this from 100 to whichever value we think is looking suitable as per this picture. Now if we look at this, this is looking a bit okay, but I think this should be a bit bigger. So I am scaling this using the transpose effect to make it a bit bigger. And using the transparency effect, you can see that I have set the transparency somewhere to 55% and this is getting merged with the background. Now these sharp edges are not looking good. So I'll again use the eraser tool, make it a bit smaller and will erase these bottom edges in a way that it gets merged with the background. So by using the opacity option, we can actually change the opacity of this picture to whatever level we want so that it actually gets merged with the background picture. Apart from opacity, we have other blending modes also available in Photoshop. In total, we have almost 27 blending modes available and each blending mode has a different outcome of the blend depending on the situation and depending on different images colors styles and requirement we can actually use the correct blending mode with our image i will not read all these blending modes in detail but i will share these slides with you in a link in the video description and you can download these slides to know more about these blending modes I'll just show them practically in Photoshop what effect does it shows when we apply these blending modes. So let's use the same example to check different blending modes. So right now the blending mode is set to normal. We can change this to dissolve. This is the first blending mode and you can see that it gives a dissolve effect where the image which we have blended gets a dotted effect. The second option is darken. This is somewhat like normal, not much of a difference, but in actual this actually darkens the image which is on top. This darkens the image which we have blended. Next is multiply and this is considered to be the best blending mode because it actually multiplies the image with its background and absorbs the color in a very natural way. Next option we have is the color burn where you can see the color which was bright that was the sunny color actually burned the image which is on the top of which we have tried to blend. So this is actually not suitable for this but this can be used in various things. The next is a linear burn. This is also a burn effect where you can see the brightness of the sun is getting highlighted from the skin. The next option we have is the darker color. In this, the color which is darker in the background or in the foreground or the image which we have blended appears in a different way. Next is the lighten effect. This actually blended the image so much that it almost got vanished. Other one is the screen. This also lightens the image a lot that it almost got merged with the background. Then we have the color dodge. In color dodge, the background color superimposes the color which we are trying to blend. The next option we have is the linear dodge. This is also similar to the color dodge but gives a different effect. Then we have lighter color. Again, here the image got so lighter that it got merged with the background. We have overlay. Overlay is another very popular method of blending where the 
color of the image which we are trying to blend superimposes the background but here due to sun the picture is getting too bright and the face is not visible so this is again not a suitable mode here we have a soft light mode this is also not look suitable then we have a hard light mode here the light which is very hard or bright gives a different sort of effect from the blended image this is again looking a bit creative in a different way where the face is getting highlighted next we have is the vivid light you can see that this also gives a different effect then we have linear light we have pin light so these are different light effects given on the image which you are trying to blend and each effect each blend mode gives a different effect the next one is the hard mix in this the image which you are trying to blend is turning into a monochrome and is actually absorbing the colors from the background then we have a difference this is actually looking like a negative of the original picture we have exclusion this is also a sort of negative but in a different color mode and we have subtract in subtract also you always get a negative of the original picture but these modes can also be used in different ways and different techniques where we want then we have the divide option in divide you can see that the complete image got faded out but this at times is very useful depending on the colors and depending on the situation the other one is hue in this you can just see that there is some color mode available but actually the image is not at all not at all visible so this blend mode is also not suitable here we have saturation this also gives a similar effect where the image is not at all visible but yes saturation again is very useful depending on the situation or depending on the colors we are trying to use this is the color effect here the image we are trying to blend picks up the colors from the background and converts the picture in a different color mode at all to check this i'm just trying to increase the opacity to 100% and you can see that both the colors the orange color of the background and the red color of the picture are getting merged giving a pink color kind of effect putting back the opacity to 50% and changing the blending mode to the last option which is luminosity now this one is actually looking the most suitable out of all the blending modes where the image is actually getting totally merged with the background and is also going in sync with the picture here the face of the model is looking grayed out because of the sun so i'm trying to adjust this image in a way that the sun is actually there in the center of the face and here you go this is the best blend mode i think is suitable for this image. let's compare this with the normal picture which we initially made so here we still see the red color which the model is wearing whereas in the last one the luminosity effect this red color also vanishes it gets blended with the background so such effects are commonly used in the magazine covers or images depending on the situation we want to use them moving on to the last section of this session as drop shadow on an image drop shadow gives the impression that the layer in your photoshop project is hovering or casting a shadow onto the background layer beneath it you can apply a drop shadow to any type of photoshop layer to help give the impression that your image exists in 3d space when used correctly a drop shadow layer can enhance any type of photoshop project from photo editing to graphic design to add a drop shadow to the image select it open photoshop and select the layer where you want to add a drop shadow click the fx icon at the bottom of the layer panel and select drop shadow 
Customize it. In the drop shadow layer style dialog box that opens, select the structure quality effects you want for your shadow. Apply it by clicking OK. To understand drop shadow, I have a different example. This is the picture of a plate kept on a table and a coffee cup which is on top. Now if you place this cup simply on top of the plate, it looks a bit weird as you can see that there is some shadow for the spoon. However, there is no shadow for the cup. So this is actually looking a quite 2D pasted cup on top of this plate. To give this a bit of 3D effect or to make it more realistic, we need to add some shadow to this cup so that this also resembles the perspective similar to the spoon which is having some shadow on the right edge. Now let's see how we can do it. So we do not want to add shadow to the plate but we want to add shadow to the cup. So this is the layer wave which we will select. We will click on the FX icon in the bottom of the layer panel and select the option of drop shadow which is the last option. Once we select this, a dialog box appears and with this we can set various options of shadow which we want to add to this particular cup. The first is the blend mode and by default we select multiply in this but you can still change it as per your requirement. Then we have the color for the shadow like which color shadow you wish to create. Usually shadows are black. But in case if you wish to give any color to the shadow, that is also possible. So if I give this red, it will create a red shadow. But by default, I will use it black. Then is the opacity of the shadow. How dark shadow you want and how light shadow you want. So I will change this to somewhere around 80. Then this is the angle for the light. So from which angle do you want to put the light source? So changing the direction will actually change the direction of shadow opposite to the selected direction of light. So if the light is falling from the left hand edge, the shadow will be created on the right hand side. If the light is falling from the right hand side, the shadow will be created on the left edge. So I'm just changing this to a bit below 180 degree. Now these three options are most important to set the shadow. This is the distance, how far we want the shadow. This is the spread, how much spread we want for the shadow. You can see the preview of the cup on the plate. And finally, this is the size of the shadow. That is how blur do you want the shadow to be. So let me bring it a bit closer. And let me reduce the spread. And now you can see. We can also adjust the opacity of the shadow as in how much shadow we require. And I click on OK. Now you see that there are new effects added to this layer. And this effect is the drop shadow. If I remove this effect. You can see what difference it makes to this image. Where the cup looks actually realistic. Having a shadow. So this brings us to the end of this session and to summarize this session, we learned about the history palette. We learned some more basic skills like place the graphic document in Photoshop, resizing the image or document, resize or rotate a selection, lines with drawing tools, creating curved designs, layer transparency and adjustment, fading an image blending two images 
and drop shadow on an image. In the next session, that is lesson 4, we will start working with the Photoshop text. So we will learn how to add a single line text, how to word wrap your text, manage line spacing, manage letter spacing, warp the text, make a text flow path, decorating text with outline and glow, and applying styles and filters to text. Thank you for joining the complete session. Hope you like the content. Please share and subscribe our channel so that your friends also get benefited with the information, acquire free knowledge and learn new things. We are eagerly looking forward to your support. Thanks, take care and stay safe. Hope to see you in the next session.